You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. Hi, everyone. The story you're about to hear is somewhat lengthy, so I will be telling it in two separate parts. Now, there is a natural break in the story, so I will pause it there, and I'll post the second part in a couple of weeks. So let's get going with part one of the story, and it begins with a question. So let's suppose you wanted to take an airplane flight around the globe, you know, this beautiful blue planet that we live on. And since you're probably like me and you don't have access to high-speed military jets, you would need to make the flight using commercial airlines. And you know what that means. You'd have to deal with the hassles of delayed flights, waiting in airport terminals or connecting flights, dealing with immigration along the way, and, you know, all the hassles associated with flying. Well, just how long do you think it would take you to make that flight? Could you do it in a day, in two days? Well, one man has set the record for doing so, and if you hang around for a bit, I will let you know just how long it took him at the end of this podcast. Of course, flying around the world today is far easier than it was in the early days of aviation. Now, one of the early pioneers in flying was a British woman named Richarda Morrow Tate, and sadly, her efforts to fly around the world are nearly forgotten today. She was born Prudence Richarda Evelyn Ralph on November 22nd of 1923, and she wasn't exactly what her father had hoped for. Quote, As far back as I can remember, it was always said that my father was so angry when I turned out to be a girl that he refused to speak to me on the day I was born. He'd already had two girls, and I was to be called Richard. That's how I was christened Richarda. So I was a third daughter, but no matter how depressing that could very well turn out to be, I did have one terrific consolation. I was born on a Thursday. Now we'll see in a short bit how being born on a Thursday would play an important part in her life. In 1943, Richarda, who went by the nickname of Dickie, was working as a temporary stenographer and she was assigned to assist a mechanical engineer named Norman Morrow Tate. He worked in the British government's Ministry of Supply at Cambridge, and he was more than a decade older than the red-headed Dickie. But the two immediately hit it off, and they were soon married. Dickie long had an interest in learning to fly an airplane, and in 1945, her husband suggested that she should do so. She first took to the air in January of 1946 and continued to take lessons on weekends. Dickie soon became the first woman to obtain a civil flying license in Britain since the war had ended. Now, right around the time that she began her flying lessons, Dickie became pregnant. On October 10th of 1946, she gave birth to a baby girl who the couple named Anna Victoria Airy Morrow Tate. But, as you can probably guess, motherhood was not about to stop Dickie from taking to the sky. Then, on May 31st of 1948, 24-year-old Richarda Morrow Tate announced to the world that she was going to attempt to be the first woman to fly an airplane around the world. To do so, she purchased a surplus Percival Proctor IV, which is a 210-horsepower single-engine plane that had been used as a communications aircraft during the war. And when you think of what a typical World War II fighter looked like, that's pretty much what this plane looked like. Now, for her round-the-world trip, the plane was outfitted with extra fuel tanks, which gave it an estimated range of 1,850 miles, or just under 3,000 kilometers. That's how far she could go without having to refill the plane. Dickie named the plane Thursday's Child, not just because she was born on a Thursday, but really because of the verse in the folk song Monday's Child. Monday's child is fair of face. Tuesday's child is full of grace. Wednesday's child is full of woe. Thursday's child has far to go. And boy, did she have far to go. 
While Dickie had mastered the flying of the plane, she was in need of a good navigator. Well, it turns out that while the Morrow Tates were at a party, they bumped into 25-year-old Michael Townsend, who just happened to be a childhood friend of Dickie's. At that time, Townsend was a student at Cambridge, and he was a former member of the Royal Air Force. He agreed to accompany Dickie on the flight, and he spent four months preparing for it. Their first setback occurred on August 14th of 1948, while Dickie was practicing for the flight. While she was piloting another plane, Dickie crash-landed at the airport in Cambridge. She was unhurt, but this event seemed to cast a very dark shadow on what was about to come. It was on Wednesday, August 18th of 1948, as her husband and daughter Anna watched from the ground, that Richard Amaro Tate and Michael Townsend lifted off from Cambridge and flew down to Croydon Airport in London to officially begin their flight around the globe. They anticipated completing the flight in six weeks. Husband Norman Morrow Tate told the press, quote, I have given her every encouragement to make this flight. I used to fly myself and I know how much flying can mean to anyone. Dickie is a wonderful person full of determination and courage. Unfortunately, upon landing in Marseille, France, the visibility was incredibly poor and the propeller, undercarriage, and one of the wings of the plane were damaged during landing. The next day she announced that she was abandoning her attempted flight and would return to England once repairs to the plane were completed. Well, that decision did not last long. Two days later, that's Friday, August 20th, Dickie announced that she would continue on with her planned flight. Finally, on Saturday, August 28th, she took off from Marseille and successfully landed later that same day in Malta. From there was on to Cyprus, Iraq, Bahrain, Sharjah in what is now the United Arab Emirates, Karachi in Pakistan, and Delhi in India. In fact, everything seemed to be going smoothly until September 7th. That is when her airplane was damaged during landing at Dum Dum Airport in Calcutta. Unfortunately, Dickie and Townsend would have to wait seven weeks for the parts to arrive and for the plane to be repaired. I guess so much for completing the flight in six weeks. It wouldn't be until October 22nd that they lifted off for Rangoon, which is today Yangon in Myanmar. This was followed by successful hops to Vietnam, Hong Kong, and five stops in Japan, you know, as she piloted the plane up the archipelago. Her next flight was going to be the longest over water. That was from Hokkaido, Japan to Shemya Island, which if you don't know is located at the western tip of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. Now due to the great length of the flight, Dickie, and she did not want to do this at first, anyway, Dickie agreed to be escorted by a U.S. Air Force B-17 bomber. Well, Dickie and Townsend took off from Hokkaido on November 3rd and encountered several storms along their flight path. At about nine hours into their flight, the B-17 lost contact with their single-engine plane. Were Dickie and Townsend okay? Could their plane have gone down at sea? Well, no one could say for sure. That was until they landed their plane on Shemya Island. Total flight time, 13 hours and 20 minutes. It turns out that they had lost contact with their escort plane after the radio was knocked out as they passed through one of those storms. Dickie later told reporters, quote, Over the Pacific, we landed with only five gallons of gas or 20 minutes flying time. I think we ran the last of it entirely on Ave Maria's. On November 11th, they left Shemya and headed east along the Aleutian chain. They stopped at Adak and Cole Bay as they made their way to Anchorage. Now, as they approached the Elmendorf Air Force Base there, they encountered thick fog, which greatly reduced their visibility. And to make matters worse, the lights on the field had failed. So two B-17s and a Civil Aeronautics Authority airplane took off to help Dickie find the field. And she made several passes with the plane, but she was unable to land. So to help bring the plane in, cars were sent out to line the runway, 
and that was so Dickie could use their headlights as a guide. As you'd expect, rescue vehicles and an ambulance were put on alert. And once again, she successfully landed the plane. Quote, It's sure good to be down. I only had enough gas to circle the field twice more. Dickie added, They talked us in three times before we made it, and I was extremely frightened. I didn't care how I landed as long as I got down. They were delayed for 10 days in Anchorage because the plane was experiencing engine trouble. This is most likely due to the extreme cold. Keep in mind they are coming into the Arctic Circle as it's approaching winter. Anyway, once repairs were complete, Dickey took off for Whitehorse in Canada's Yukon Territory. And since there was concern over the engine's reliability, the decision was made to follow highways you know, just in case they needed to set down and make an emergency landing. Sadly, on what just happened to be Dickie's 25th birthday, that is exactly what happened. Just prior to noon on November 22nd of 1948, sub-zero weather caused her plane's carburetor to ice up and she was forced to crash land near Tanacross, Alaska. Now, the Army plane that accompanied her dropped emergency supplies while the Alaska Highway Patrol picked up the flyers and drove them into Tanacross. They were uninjured, but the plane lay in ruins along the Alaskan Highway. Honestly, it was destroyed. Both the plane's landing gear and the wings were severely damaged. Unfortunately, Dickey was low on funds, so they could neither afford to truck the plane to Canada for repairs nor could they afford to bring the necessary parts up to Alaska. Dickey stated, quote, What I need for a birthday present is a miracle. While we're not quite halfway through the story, I think this is probably the best place to pause it. Now, in part two, you'll find out what happened next. You know, with Dickey and Townsend stuck in the remote wilderness of Alaska without an airplane, just how in the world are they going to get back to England? You know, could the plane be repaired or did it have to be junked? And if it was junk, could they get another plane? I mean, where would you do that in Alaska in the middle of nowhere? In other words, did she get her miracle? Well, stay tuned. There's still a few more twists and turns to the story, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Halo, everybody, halo. Halo is the shampoo that glorifies your hair. So halo, everybody, halo. Use Halo Shampoo if you want naturally bright and beautiful hair. For soap shampoos, leave a film on your hair. But Halo contains no soap, therefore leaves no dulling soap film. The very first time you use Halo, you'll notice your hair glistens in all its natural brilliance. The deep, full, natural color and luster come sparkling through like sunshine through a clean window pane. And remember, even in the hardest water, Halo makes oceans of rich, fragrant lather. Halo quickly carries away loose dandruff, grease, and dirt. Needs no lemon or vinegar rinse. Because Halo leaves no dulling soap film. Nothing to hide your hair's natural beauty. Say hello to Halo and goodbye to dulling soap film. Use Halo on your children's hair, too. Get Halo shampoo at any cosmetic counter. Remember, Halo glorifies your hair. Oh, hello, everybody, hello, hello, shampoo, hello. That commercial for Halo Shampoo is from the November 20th, 1945 broadcast of the Theater of Romance. This particular episode was titled No Time for Comedy and starred the late, great Jimmy Stewart, who just happened to be starring in a film of the same name at the same time. Promotion, maybe? Hmm... Anyway, Theater of Romance ran on the CBS radio network from 1943 through 1957. It was considered to be a filler program. That's because it would only run at times when other popular shows were not running on the network. And just like you heard in this episode, many of the stories on the show starred big-name actors who were really there just performing scripts based on movies they were trying to promote at the time. As for Halo Shampoo itself, the product was introduced in 1938 by what was then Colgate-Palmolive Pete, 
As a little side note, Pete was dropped from the name in 1953. That jingle you just heard, you know, Halo, everybody, Halo, that would be sung by many celebrities and recording artists over the years, and that included old Blue Eyes himself, Frank Sinatra, Peggy Lee, and Eddie Cantor. By 1956, the company was claiming that it was the best-selling shampoo here in the United States. But from what I can tell, you can't buy it here anymore. Now, if you do desire a bottle, Colgate Palmolive is still producing it in India, and a few people are selling bottles on eBay. But each bottle costs at least $25 US, and of course they're shipping it from India, so it's going to be quite costly. Honestly, at that price, it better do something miraculous. You know, maybe cure baldness or magically reverse graying. I don't know. Not worth it if you ask me. Now, since the main story in today's podcast was about an attempted flight around the world, here are three additional stories that all involve transportation in some way. In 1912, Gleason Murphy, who was then vice president of the General Motors Truck Company, predicted that the age of the horseless city was not very far away. He thought that the horse could disappear from city streets within the present generation. Quote, Today the horse is a municipal luxury. He costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep the streets clean and is a menace to health, especially in the crowded city districts. The horse has retarded the proper sanitation of cities more than any other obstacle. We have tolerated the horse all of these years because he has been a necessity, but his days of usefulness is past. He is going into decline. For thousands of years he has been a common beast of burden, but the horseless vehicle has been his undoing. His day of supremacy is now a matter of history. He continues, Municipalities, corporations, and even smaller firms who have use for only a single job are changing their horse equipment for the new as speedily as it can be brought about. To make this statement that it's only a question of time before cities will take some legal action to remove the horse from the streets is not stating an improbability. He continued, It is simply a matter of education and time, but that time will surely come, and within the next decade or so. Next, on June 25th, 1923, a very unique golf match was held at the Olympia Field Country Club in Chicago, Illinois. It was a round of airplane golf, and it pitted a team of nine professional golfers against nine amateur golfers. So you're probably wondering, how would aerial golf work? Well, unfortunately, not as well as the event planners had hoped. The basic idea is that there were two airplanes from which golf balls would be dropped down as near as possible to the putting greens on the course below. The professional golf balls had white ribbons attached to them, and the amateur balls had red ribbons attached. Wherever these balls landed, the players on the ground would substitute undecorated balls and attempt to drop them into the hole with the fewest number of strokes. Well, things got off to a rocky start when one of the two airplanes involved hit a sprinkler during a practice run. As a result, the other airplane had to drop the balls for both teams. At the end of the match, the amateurs won by sinking the golf balls in 25 strokes. The professionals took 26 strokes to do the same, although it was pointed out that the white ribbons attached to their balls were wider than the red ribbons. That caused their balls to travel a greater distance before striking the green, and that basically put the professionals at a disadvantage. And in our last story for today, which is dated July 3rd of 1938, Joseph Gemma, who was a resident of Providence, Rhode Island, he was sentenced to five years in prison and fined $500. That's about $9,200 today. He was fined $500 for stealing, quote, a railroad in broad daylight. Now, he had previously appealed the case to the state Supreme Court, but they upheld the lower court decision and ruled that he must pay the penalty for his crime. So just how does someone steal an entire railroad? Well, you do it in tiny little pieces. 
You see, Gemma had created a false sales agreement for the abandoned Harrisville Woonsocket Railroad two years prior. And that supposedly allowed him to have a gang of workers remove 250 tons of rails piece by piece and, of course, sell the iron for scrap. Well, not exactly legal. So at the beginning of the podcast, I'd ask you how long it took the world record holder to fly around the world via commercial airlines. Well, let's start with a little background first. The very first aerial circumnavigation was completed by an eight-man team of the United States Army Air Service. That's a precursor to the U.S. Air Force. They completed their circumnavigation in 1924. Get this. It took the men 175 days to complete the trip. Definitely not very speedy. So many times during my teaching career, and this is since I taught about time zones every year, I was asked by a student what would happen if you could fly in a plane so fast that you kept crossing the international date line over and over again each day. They wondered if you could travel back in time by doing so. Of course, I pointed out this was not possible. Not only can you not travel back in time, but making a single flight around the globe takes far longer than most people think. The current record holder for polar circumnavigation of the globe was completed on July 11th of 2019. That's just a little over a year ago. Coined the One More Orbit mission, it was to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. What they did is they had a team of pilots fly a Gulfstream G650ER ultra-long-range jet at an average speed of 534.97 miles per hour. That's 860.95 kilometers per hour. Their flight was completed in a record setting, ready for this, 46 hours, 39 minutes, and 38 seconds. That's nearly two days. So this idea of going round and round the earth and crossing the international date line over and over again, probably not very practical in an airplane. But my question was, what was the record if you try to fly around the earth via commercial airlines? Well, this obviously introduces all kinds of problems, you know, including layovers, missed flights, delays. And of course, commercial flights don't necessarily take the shortest path around the Earth. Well, the current record was set by New Zealander Andrew Fisher, who is an executive for Etihad Airways in the United Arab Emirates. Fisher had long dreamed of making this trip around the world. Quote, I have had a passion for aviation from when I was a kid, and used to spend hours as a teenager reviewing airline route networks and timetables. He continued, When I saw this world record category existed, I immediately felt I could beat it. He began his flight on January 21st of 2018 as a passenger on an Air New Zealand flight from Shanghai to Auckland. He had three layovers totaling five and a half hours in Auckland, Buenos Aires, and Amsterdam. When he landed back in Shanghai on January 23rd, he had completed his trip around the world in 52 hours and 34 minutes. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. I'll get the second half of that story on Dickie Morrow Tate, who had been christened the flying housewife at the time of her flight. I'll get that recorded and posted within the next couple of weeks. As I've already mentioned, uh, where I chose to break the story wasn't quite halfway through it. In fact, I think it might be closer to about a third of the way through. But I felt there were so many dates and locations popping up throughout the story that I didn't really want to lose people, so I thought it'd be better to break it into two parts. Just a reminder that my new book, The Flipside History, is currently available. If you enjoy listening to the stories that I include in this podcast or post my website, I highly encourage you to get a copy of the book. It is also available as an audiobook, although I was not asked to do the narration for the recording. Be sure to sign up for my Twitter feed. It's at UselessInfoCast, and that'll allow you to be among the first to know when a new episode is released. Again, as I've said before, the handle is at UselessInfoCast. Also, be sure to like the show on Facebook. You can just do a quick search for the Useless Information Podcast there, and hopefully it'll pop up. Make sure you subscribe to the Useless Information Podcast. Um, you can do so on Amazon Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn. This is actually quite lengthy. Basically, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. 
Anyway, thanks for listening. Hope you tune in the next time. Take care, everyone. Bye.